Great. Well, good afternoon. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into this afternoon's session. Lord Jesus, we want to come before you this afternoon. We give you thanks that you are a God who is in control, that you know the beginning from the end. There is nothing, Father, that surprises you or takes you aback. And Father, we ask that as we go through this session this afternoon, that you give us wisdom, clarity of thought, that we would walk away from here challenged and hopefully further equipped to be salt and light in this dark world. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Man as God. A heavy topic? Yes. We're living in sobering times? No question. If you want something light and easy, you came to the wrong place this afternoon, and I make no apology for it. Because we are indeed living in challenging times, we then need to dig into what it is that is moving us in that direction. And so this afternoon, I'm hoping when it's done, you're going to walk away going, ha, oh, I feel overwhelmed by the material. And yet at the same time, I'm hoping that there's something here that you take out, a thread of thought, a, continue, a continuization of thought from beginning to end. And as we go through this session, you'll realize how this works. Man as God, living the first lie. Here is the passage that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this. In fact, I hope this repeats over the course of the next few days because it is true. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new. Nothing that I will present here today will be new because at its heart, at the core of it, it comes from a similar source. It comes from the same point of view. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 is absolutely true. Nothing new under the sun. Well, in 1999, I had a chance to go to a New Age event. It was a meeting of occult leaders and New Age practitioners. And when I go to events like this, I like to sit in a, a location where I can tape record it well, because I tape record all my sessions, all the places I go to, tape record it well, and yet be close enough to an exit sign so I can vamoose if all of a sudden things get a little bit strange. But I was in a bad spot. I couldn't get good sound, and so I sat fairly close up to the front. And then, as the day progressed, one of the speakers said, get up, everybody rise, and form a circle and hold hands. And I'm like, oh no, I am too far from the exit. This isn't going to work. And I ended up holding hands in this big circle, and it was explained to us that energy would infuse this circle. And all I was doing is praying, Lord, this is not a good place. I don't like it. And as we were gathered in this big ring, a, a singer stepped into the center and started singing to us. And this is some of the song lyrics. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Sounds like an evangelical song, doesn't it? I am I am. I am the Word of God. I am the Lamb. I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. I am holy, holy Lord. God, Al God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. I am that I am. When this song was complete, the organizer stepped back into the middle of the circle and said, the Christ within me salutes, honors, and respects the Christ within each and every one of you. At that point, hands dropped and everybody bowed to each other as deities. And I stood there, numb by what I was witnessing. What I had just witnessed was a, an actual, you could say an actual resurrection of Genesis. Primarily, Genesis chapter 3. This was the living of the first lie, the big lie, the original lie. Flip open to your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. We need to read these verses. Actually, we'll read verse 6 as well. Because this is it. This is where it starts. This is where everything really starts. When we want to understand deception, when we want to understand the way the world is moving. Genesis 3, 1 to 5. 1 to 6, pardon me. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first lie. This is the great deception. Notice some of the Luciferian tactics that take place in this passage. There's a focus on doubt. Did God really say, did he really say that to you? And then there's an alternative. You will not die. You will live. Indeed, you will live forever. And then there's the offer of almost a form of Gnosticism. In, in, in essence, it is the first Gnostic promise that there will be salvation through knowledge, special spiritual knowledge. You will be as God, knowing good and evil. You will be as God. What are the implications? They are huge. In essence, it says that God is keeping you from everything that you're supposed to be. Almost sounds like a Nike or a, a commercial of some kind, doesn't it? You're being kept back from who you truly are. You are being kept in the dark. In the occult version, the occult view of it, and yes, the occult actually has a view of Genesis. The occult version says this. Yahweh is jealous, vindictive, restrictive. He is holding you down. He is keeping you in chains. He is keeping you in bondage. He is keeping you ignorant. Whereas the Luciferian perspective is one of enlightenment, illumination, intellect, a gift of knowledge, choice. That is the occult interpretation of Genesis chapter 3. Interestingly, when you go through some of the occult literature of the day, and even the occult literature that goes back a hundred years, you find interesting titles like Lucifer, the light bearer, Lucifer, Gnosis, even this idea of a true science of light. Indeed, the occult is nothing more than the science of Luciferic light. And so this is at the core of what is taking place in Genesis chapter 3. The Luciferic being comes and says, you can be as God. You can be as God. Reminds me of Proverbs 14, verse 12. And I pity the man who stops at the stop sign. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So true. It's a dead end. It stops. It's finished. It leads to death. Yet, we have been defiant. Yet mankind at our hearts, in our hearts, we are defiant creatures. Reminds me of Shirley MacLaine. Some of you here, I'm sure, remember seeing Shirley MacLaine's miniseries, Out on a Limb. And do you remember when she stood at the beach with her friend and she had her arms spread and she was saying, I am God. And her friend countered and stood beside her parallel and said, I am God. And the two of them go back and forth, back and forth, making this proclamation. Shirley MacLaine is getting older. She pays bills. She has wrinkles. I am sure that she has bad days. Not the kind of God that I think I'll follow. You get my drift. And yet this is the lie revisited over and over again. This is the heart of Mormonism. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. It's also the secret of Freemasonry. Joseph Fort Newton. Here lies the great secret of Masonry, that it makes a man aware of that divinity within him. And Manly P. Hall, one of the most important Masonic scholars of the last century, said this, Man is a god in the making, and as in the mystic myths of Egypt, on the potter's wheel he is being molded. When his light shines out to lift and preserve all things, he receives the triple crown of godhood. J.D. Buck, a member of the Masonic Lodge, 
a Masonic scholar, a Masonic historian, and also a member of the Theosophical Society, wrote this, a very telling statement. It is far more important that men should strive to become Christ than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. Jesus is no less divine because all men may reach the same divine perfection. I'm waiting for lightning bolts on that one. Theosophy, started by this happy-looking lady, Blavatsky, and followed up by Annie Besant and Alice Bailey and many others since then, teaches the same thing. It has as its core the same philosophy. Theosophy is the mother of the New Age movement. Theosophy is a combination of the teachings of Freemasonry, Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Western-based occultism. It meshes it together. It brings it all together into a new mystical way of looking at life. And it's called Theosophy. And when you hear about the New Age movement, and you hear the term thrown around, think Theosophy, because that is its roots. This is what Annie Besant said. Man is not to be compelled. He is to be free. He is not a slave, but a God in the making. Genesis chapter 3. In the New Age, nothing can touch me but the direct action of God, and God is my omnipotent self. I can do all things through the strength of the Christ I am. I am strength. The captions are in original from John Randolph Price, leader of the New Age movement, particularly during the 1980s. Do you see the same thread? Do you see the same theme? There is nothing new under the sun. We revisit the big lie. Oprah. Who here watches Oprah? A few of you, I'm sure. Turn on the television once in a while, and there she is. I guarantee you, your neighbors watch Oprah. And yet what she has been promoting, and what she's been teaching, does nothing more than parrot what we've seen so far. She promotes Eckhart Tolle with his books. One of his books, The Power of Now, says that you can substitute Christ for presence, if that is more meaningful to you. Christ is your God essence or self. In A Course of Miracles, which she promoted for quite some time, Lesson 29 says this, God is in everything I see. Lesson 61 says, I am the light of the world. You see the parallels? Do you really get the, the, the drift that's coming through this? The almost Christianese terminology, the biblical terminology? And then Lesson 70 says this, My salvation comes from me. My salvation comes from me? I'm my own God? Guess what? I'm a fool, just like everybody else in this room. I have struggles, just like everybody else in this room. I have challenges, just like everybody else in this room. I hate getting up in the mornings. And sometimes I don't go to bed very early, and when I wake up, it's like, mm, my salvation is me, your salvation is you. Let's get real, ladies and gentlemen. It reminds me of a time in 1999 when I heard the Dalai Lama speak in Indianapolis where he talked about how he had seen millennium after millennium after millennium because he is a form of a deity. And then the Dalai Lama went on to explain that he had Coke bottle thick glasses, he had pimples, the U.S. Secret Service was there to protect him. And I thought, wow, what a sorry state you are as a deity. You're just like me. You've got problems. So much for me being God, isn't it? so much for that. Maybe, however, the works of my hands. Maybe I can become a god through the works of my right arm. Maybe through technology we can achieve godhood. This is the idea behind eugenics, technocracy, and transhumanism. It's about creating the new ubermenschen, the superman. Who here has heard of eugenics? I'm sure most of you have. Hands go up? Yes. Technocracy. Anybody? One, two, a few of you, you probably read my publication, don't you? Yes. We've been dealing with the subject of technocracy now for quite some time, and it's an important topic. Transhumanism. Anybody? Anybody here heard of transhumanism? One, two hands go up. You know, ladies and gentlemen, in the church, unfortunately, taking a look at history, we have often just given pat answers to easy questions, even hard questions, we've been given pat answers. We're going to be really challenged in the church in the next 10 to 15 years by some major changes taking place. And we need to give a reasoned answer 
and answer for what we believe. Using scripture and using logic and our intellect, we cannot deny that we have become scripturally illiterate and intellectually lazy. These movements will challenge that. Well, what is eugenics? Well, it's an old idea. It comes from Charles Darwin and primarily his cousin, Francis Galton. It's the idea of social Darwinism. It's the concept that humanity can breed the perfect man. Humanity can, through selective and through very purposefully designed breeding programs, create a new race. In the Nazi system, it was called the Aryan. Science becomes the tool through which natural selection occurs. The heydays of this movement, where it really reached its apex, was from approximately 1900 to 1945. And it wasn't just a Nazi idea. No, no, no. In 1907, Indiana was the first of approximately 30 states to pass racial hygiene laws. The idea that we will now sterilize the feeble-minded. We will sterilize the infirm. We will sterilize those who have, those who have poor family backgrounds, questionable family backgrounds. We'll dig into your past. We'll decide who can breed and who cannot based on what your father or grandfather or mother or grandmother's convictions were, what their lifestyle was like. That was the eugenics movement already back then. Racial hygiene. Canada, Australia, Japan, we all followed suit to some extent. Nazi Germany, however, took it to its logical conclusion with racial laws. And we take a look at Nazi Germany and immediately we think of the Holocaust against the Jews and the Slavs and others in Eastern Europe. And yet, where did the Holocaust in Germany really start? The Holocaust really started first by eliminating feeble-minded and chronically ill Germans, where they were taken first to be exterminated because they were in danger of having the race contaminated by the poor breeding stock. This is eugenics. It's the idea that we can remake man in our image. What's technocracy? It's basically the religion of humanity and stems back 150 some years philosophically. Actually, you can go back even further than that to men whose worldviews have permeated our day. Men whose names, some of them have already been forgotten. Saint Simon, Auguste Comte, and others. It's the idea that science replaces God. Technicians, engineers, experts know the way that we need to go. They know the course, and they will chart the course. Society is remade by those who are technically inclined. Technology, therefore, becomes the tool to control. Technology becomes the tool to change behaviors. Does this sound familiar at all? In our governments, even today, we have entire commissions and expert working groups and all types of different attachments in the scientific community. It's not what is best necessarily for you, the constituents, but first of all, we go to the experts. We always go to the experts because the experts know best. In technocracy, that idea was taken, or was hoped to be taken, right to its final conclusion. We wouldn't even have a government. We would simply be managed by experts. This is technocracy. In fact, for those of you who are probably in your 80s, you may even remember this movement because in Western Canada, it swept the prairies. It ended up becoming, we ended up having study groups on the subject matter. Winnipeg published books on technocracy. In fact, the technocracy study course, one of the last editions of it came from Winnipeg. Nothing new under the sun. Well, this is what technocracy says about breeding. Technocracy envisions, envisions another form of domestic, domestication, a form in which man may become more than man through breeding with specific individuals for specific purposes. A technocracy then should in time produce a race of men superior in quality to any now known on earth. 1933. So then, what is transhumanism? Transhumanism, you could say, is the rebirth of eugenics, married with techno technology, married with the old ideas of technocracy, to create, again, a new 
species, a new individual. We will take through our hands, through the powers of our hands, and we will then move humanity forward. We will redesign evolution in our image. We will recreate the way we want to. It's a purposeful redesigning, and it integrates biometrics, it integrates the idea of nanotechnology, computer enhancements. It's the idea of merging consciousness with virtual reality, DNA splicing. I mean, where transhumanism is going makes stem cell research look like a walk in the park. If we think we have issues now with stem cell research, wait until the research is done and the research really becomes public and really gets going in respect to DNA gene splicing within the human genome. We already do it in plants. We already monkey around with animals. We're next. In fact, the research is well on its way. It's the idea that science and technology will bring us eternal youth. It's this concept that we'll have new powers as man. Actually, it's humanity plus. And, of course, we have culture that says that's the direction we need to go. In some of our Hollywood flicks, the technology is evil. and some of it, it's really good. But all the way through, there's this general theme, and you really have seen it a lot in the last 10 years, that mankind is somehow moving beyond being man, that we can merge, that we can blend, that we can become more than human. Avatar was a case in point. The movie Splice that just came out not that long ago has this wonderful subtitle, She's Not Human, Not Entirely, all about gene splicing. And it's not Hollywood that's just interested in this. The medical community, the computer industry, some of the largest names in the computing industry have been flirting and playing with this. This is the wave of the future. Let me tell you, if you're, in if you're interested in, in investing nanotechnology and the splicing and meddling of the genome is where the big business is going. That's the movement. This isn't Hollywood anymore. This isn't the bionic man of the 1970s. This is the Superman, the humanity plus of today. One particular researcher, Richard Seed, who's a nuclear physicist and very involved in the cloning industry or the cloning concept, says this. We are going to become gods, period. If you don't like it, get off. You don't have to contribute. You don't have to participate. But if you're going to interfere with me becoming God, then we'll have big trouble. We'll have warfare. The only way to prevent me is to kill me. And you kill me, I'll kill you. Wow. There's the heart. Technocracy and spirituality. Transhumanism and spirituality. Eugenics and spirituality. This is where we're going. Genesis chapter 3 is nothing new under the sun. But we're going to see the world divide in the next 15 or 20 years, and this is what's being talked about. How do we wrestle through this between the haves and the have-nots? You can be a have if you have the money, if you have the bucks, if you have the power to become a post-human, to become beautiful forever. You may have the, if you have the cash, you may have that ability. And the rest of us are just going to be, well... <clears throat> sad-looking humans, because that's the direction that this is going, the haves and the have-nots. So if you can't afford to upgrade, and that's the language that's being used, if you can't afford to upgrade your software, well, maybe what we need to look for is a political savior. Maybe we can look to the United Nations or some other idea of a global government to be our savior, to be godlike for us. This idea brings into play the concepts of international human rights, alleviating poverty, meeting the world challenges. Maybe we can have an international savior to bust through all the problems of mankind and take us to the next level. When I was at the United Nations Millennium Forum in the year 2000, we kind of talked a little bit about that. We viewed the United Nations or how it was expressed to us as man's best hope for humanity. And so we talked about all kinds of things that would allow the United Nations to become the entity that takes us and moves us 
into this century and that will mold us to become the people we were always meant to be. One spiritual leader within the United Nations, one of the actual leaders of the UN Meditation Group, said this already back in 1973. There is every possibility that the United Nations will be the last word in human perfection. And then the United Nations can easily bloom in excellence and stand as the pinnacle of divine enlightenment. It's the language of Genesis 3. You will see illumination through an institution, through this corporate collective body of man's best and brightest. Robert Mueller, who is a former United Nations official, made this statement already back in 1982. What the world needs today is a convergence of the different religions. There's a famous painting and poster which shows Christ knocking at the tall United Nations building, wanting to enter it. I often visualize in my mind another even more accurate painting, that of the United Nations which would be the body of Christ. If you don't quite get it, you will. This is nothing more than a replay of the old lie, now institutionalized. Bertrand Russell, one of the most important thinkers of the last century, actually considered probably the most important philosopher of the last century, also recognized the need for world government as the final solution, the final manager. This is what he said in 1959. I believe that owing to men's folly, a world government will only be established by force and will therefore be at first cruel and despotic. But I believe that it is necessary for the pres preservation of a scientific civilization and that if once realized, it will gradually give rise to the other conditions of a tolerable existence. We will crush you and crush you and crush you to make sure that we have a government that will remain over top of the world. We will crush you. We will establish it by force. It will be cruel. It will be despotic. And it's for your own good. That's the language here that Bertrand Russell is bringing forward. And yet, this isn't new. We've seen how this experiment plays out, haven't we? Listen, it's often been said that war is the greatest cause of suffering in the world. There's nothing worse than war. Yes, there is something worse than war. And that is despotic governments who kill their own people in the name of peace. Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Hitler, Pol Pot. Unbelievable amount of dead under Pol Pot. All under the name of peace. It, it boils down to like a, a maximum, a motto. Peace is the destruction of all opposition. Is this what we want? Is this the direction we want to go? collectivization, but first through force? Hmm. No thank you. This sounds kind of scary to me. I don't like it one bit. We know what history did. We know what history is doing even now. No thank you. What we need, therefore, is the right kind of leadership. When I've been to various world government and United Nations meetings, this question comes up. How do we keep from being that despotic world government? How do we stop ourselves from going down that road? Well, we need enlightened leadership. We need the right man at the helm. And this may come through uh, some form of, of, of institution, maybe a council or a group of, of commissioners or a hero. Who knows what? But we need leadership. Here's one idea that has been chucked around, the idea of a group of elders. We need world elders who are specifically wise in the ways of the world. And so Peter Gabriel and Richard Branson of Virgin fame put together this group of individuals called the Elders with Nelson Mandela and Kofi Annan and Jimmy Carter and others. And they've been flying around to hot spots around the world, primarily in the African continent, to try to sort out problems, to try to be the global ambassadors for peace in hot spots that are really difficult to, to get a grip of what's going on. How do we deal with this? Maybe that's what we need. We need a group of special wise men, the elders. Or maybe we need a cult of personality. One man, one person who can just seem to pull it all together. Interestingly, we've seen how cults of personality work. Mikhail Gorbachev had a cult of personality. A very, very charismatic individual. A very influential individual. A 
especially at the end of the Cold War. Talk about a man in his day. World leaders flocked to him. He, in fact, he was even compared to Jesus. Multitudes took after this man because Mikhail Gorbachev offered some form of salvation in our view. He broke down the Berlin Wall and ended this incredible stalemate, the Cold War. Well, I don't think he's anything like the man that we will have coming down the road to bring this all together, but that gives you an idea. Pope John Paul II had that same type of charisma, that cult of personality. Millions flocked to hear him speak. And when he died, multitudes went to Rome to march by his, to march in the funeral procession and to march through Rome in support of the deceased Catholic head. A cult of personality. We are drawn towards these kinds of people. We're drawn towards those who seem bigger than us, bigger than ourselves, those who can somehow answer the tough questions and solve the world problems. And Barack Obama, cult of personality. I'm not saying Barack Obama, Obama is the antichrist or anything even remotely close to that, but what I am saying is we as humans are gullible for those individuals who seem to be greater than ourselves and who offer a solution. This I didn't make up. Messiah 2008, I did not make that up. If you want to do something really interesting on Google, look up Barack Obama, Messiah, and you're going to have all kinds of sites pop up, blog sites, all kinds of t-shirts that you can buy or could have bought, all spouting this idea that he's now the savior of mankind. It's actually kind of freaky in a way because it just, to me, demonstrates the gullibility that we have as people. Well, this is what Oprah says. Remember Oprah? Fairly influential. We're here to evolve to a higher plane. The reason I love Barack Obama is because he is an evolved leader who can bring evolved leadership. Chicago Sun-Times. Obama, to me, must be not just an ordinary human being, but indeed an advanced soul come to lead America out of this mess. And from Huffington Post, I see Barack Obama as a leader for this transcendent moment, the agent of transformation in an age of revolution, as a figure uniquely qualified to open the door to the 21st century. We're searching for a world king. Back in 2000, when I was attending the United Nations Millennium Forum, this little document was being handed out called Transformation of the World, and in it had various images such as this one, a world king, a humanist king that would lead us through our mess. This is what the document says. I realize the quote is lengthy. Bear with me. It's important. The world does need a civilized coordinator in international relations and in settling global problems. More than that, this coordinator must be a stabilizing factor, actually the last-ditch authority on the earth. He must win confidence of each man and each nation. People must be stark sure that this coordinator would solve any problem in a just and humane way. And one should be sure that in him we would find understanding and sympathy, that he would treat any nation as his own son. Can the world community do without a coordinator? Definitely not. I read that and it sent shivers down my spine. It's interesting to see what direction the world is going. We're looking for a world savior. We're looking for the God of man, in man himself. Well, we're coming around full circle, aren't we? Marie Strong, former United Nations official, very involved at the World Bank as an advisor, said this in his book in 2000, we are gods now, God's in charge of our own destiny. Now, Marie Strong doesn't come from, you know, someplace like exotic like Paris or Moscow or Peking. He grew up in Oak Lake, Manitoba. And yet, in the 1990s, primarily in the 1990s, one of the most influential men that the world see, saw at the time. And Marie Strong firmly believes that we need some type of global institution, some type of coordinating body, some way to make us go beyond where we're at today so that we can be gods now in charge of our own destiny. Well, what about Christianity? What about us? What about the church? If this is the direction that the world is going, 
If this is the big lie that forms the foundation of everything that we've seen so far, how now does the church respond? Hmm. We respond by holding hands with other religions. The G8 World Religions Summit. Who here is from Winnipeg? Quite a few hands. Yes. All right. Who here heard about the G8 World Religion Summit in Winnipeg? A few hands go up. Quite a few hands go up. Good. Before the event took place, I venture to say not many folks did. Now, this was an event that paralleled the G8 and G20 political summits in Ontario. It was a gathering of world religious leaders to formulate policies and procedures and to give guidance to the political leaders and so that the world could, could come together in peace and harmony. The, the concept behind it really was this. We need to come together because Mother Earth is dying. Mother Earth, in fact, we were told is crying. Mother Earth is in mourning and weeping because of all the incredible destruction we have leveled on the goddess. That was one component. Another part was we need to somehow come together to alleviate poverty and to fix the world's troubles in an economic sense. And so we were told that there is not only one way, religiously speaking, but that there are many ways. We were called to serve the God we know by so many names. And we were told over and over again that we were all brothers and sisters, religiously, all brothers and sisters in this room. And that the work we were doing was to help mankind transcend. Well, who was there? Here's some of the non-Christian religious leadership that was present. We had First Nation spiritual leaders, lots from the Baha'i community, Canadian Council of Imams, and we had actually two representatives of uh, the Saudi, Arabi, Saudi Arabian um, Muslim ministry, I believe, with a beautiful, big, flowing capes. They were an incredible sight to see as they walked through this group. We had the Canadian Council of Conservative Synagogues, Hindu Federation, and the Sikhs came with their incredible orange outfits. We had individuals from the Sikh community, and we had Shinto leaders, primarily one from Japan, who flew all the way to Winnipeg to have Shinto prayers and lead Shinto prayers with this group of religious leaders here to save the day. And we had Christianity. In fact, this isn't the full list of Christian groups that were represented and sat at the table, and who never once spoke out, never once when given the opportunity, never once when somebody said all religions are essentially equal or made a statement along those lines, never once spoke out and said Jesus Christ is the only way. Because if we did that in an interfaith setting, we would not be in harmony. We would not be working together in the name of peace. We don't want to bridge that we don't want to somehow cause that type of conflict. And so we had groups like the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, who actually was involved in actually hosting the event, Canadian Council of Churches. Where these individuals in these organizations sit, I don't know. But I know that by being there, we are now promoting something that is exceedingly dangerous. Salvation Army, World Evangelical Alliance, the Mennonite Church Canada, and the list goes on. But this is the way of Christianity, isn't it? This is the direction of the church. I'm going to give you a couple of examples from Islam. From the Mennonite Central Committee document, What is Palestine? Israel. Christians, Jews, and Muslims all believe in the same God. Christians, Muslims, and Jews call God by different names depending on their native languages. But all these names, pardon me, all these terms refer to the same God. Do they? I've, I have not read through all of the Quran, but I have read through enough of the Quran and enough of some of the Hadiths to realize that the character of Allah is not in keeping with the character of Yahweh. Not even close. The character of the Islamic Jesus does not keep in character with the character of the Biblical Jesus. Not even close. And yet, within the Mennonite community, we want to confuse this somehow. We throw this into turmoil. What are we saying? I've had some people say, well, you know, the, the name Allah means God. It means God, and we all talk about God. It has to be the same God because we're saying God. Well, whip de doo I can turn into the Winnipeg telephone book or Southern Manitoba, the Winkler telephone book, and I'm going to pick on Abe Friesen, wherever you are, 
and, and you will see a Friesen. Abe Friesen, Abraham Friesen, A Friesen, Abe Friesen, Abraham, Abraham Friesen, A, 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 A. Are they all the same A Friesens? Come on, no, of course not. So don't tell me that somehow Allah and Yahweh are one and the same because we somehow use a generic term called God. Shame on us. Shame on us. And yet in 2007, we find leading evangelicals, including, unfortunately, Rick Warren, but in a sense, it doesn't surprise me either, coming together with this Loving God and Neighbor Together program, working with Islam hand in hand, and basically equating Allah with the Christian God. Why? Peace. It's all about peace. We have a cult of peace within our midst. Here's one final example from, unfortunately, a Mennonite perspective from the Herald Press, Mennonite Church Canada, published this book, Meeting Multi-Faith Neighbors, which expressed itself in the fact that truth could only be found through mutual exploration of other religions and other faiths. This is the only way that we can find truth in a multicultural world. This is it. So this is what we have. We have an opinion-driven church. In Isaiah 45, 22, God says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Yet what we're saying, in essence, is that our opinion of religion is somehow higher than God's standard of religion. When we flirt with these interfaith conferences and in this interfaith context, when we go alongside of, with this movement, in essence, what we're saying is the religion of our, pardon me, the opinion of our religion and an opinion of religion, period, supersedes the word, the authority of God. It goes right back to Genesis chapter 3. We, in essence, are saying, really, at the heart of it, we know best. We're God. It goes back to there is nothing new under the sun. Well, we're coming to a close, but here's a few verses that really help pull us together. And of course, Genesis 3, we've already touched on this over and over again. Eat of it, and your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So, we have saw here, here how the world is living the big lie. We've seen the social context, the political context. We've seen the community context, the institutional context. How are you living the big lie? I guarantee you, you are living the big lie. Somehow, somewhere in your life, in my life, I live the big lie. I am ashamed to say, as a Christian, I fall. As a Christian, I am weak. And I know you are as well. Through Christ, the big lie is defeated. And yet, I still struggle. So the question is here, how do you live through the big lie? Well, this came to me from a non-Christian individual. This is what he said, and I thought it was very accurate. My problem isn't that I think too highly of myself. My problem isn't that I think too lowly of myself. My problem is that the only person I think about is myself. And it reflects, of course, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. So, how long will you love delusions and seek false gods, including yourself? In fact, that's really much more important. It is much more important. What is your God? Money? Matthew chapter 5 says we have to, have a, we have to make a choice between God and mammon. What is it? your personality, your popularity, your business, your community sense of worth. What is it? What is it that causes you to still follow the big lie, the first lie? How are you still living it? It's a hard question. It's one I hope that we walk away from thinking through and reflecting on. Because what we're doing is nothing different than what the world is doing when it comes to think, thinking of self. The antidote for the big lie is Jesus Christ. The antidote for the big lie is Jesus Christ, replacing self. And that's the heartbeat of Christianity. That should be our heartbeat. 
So here's some final perspectives. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, not of the strength of your technology, of your hand, lest anyone should boast. Jesus makes this very clear where the final authority rests. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And finally, Isaiah 44, God is very emphatic. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock I know, not one, including yourselves. It is Christ and Christ alone. The challenge before us now in a world that is rapidly changing, radically changing, is how do we live for Christ and not self? How do we be the salt and the light in a world that is rapidly embracing the big lie and seeking Godhood? Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you this afternoon. We recognize that we are failures, we are fools, we are sinners. And that is only through you and your power, through your shed blood, Jesus, through your resurrection, that there is anything at all that we can cling to. You are the beginning and the end. You are the first and the last. And we are finite beings made in your image. Yes, we are eternal in that sense, Father, but we desperately need you because we cannot save ourselves. We are not God. You and you alone, Lord. You, Father, are the God. You are all that there is, not us. And Lord Jesus, we just pray that as we leave here, you would challenge us in that respect. That as the other speakers come forward and give presentations, that all the way through the perspective, Lord, would be on you. We pray all this in your name.